All right, thank you. Do you hear me? Like, uh, no? Better? Uh, it's better. Yes. Hello, hello? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, thanks for coming uh, to my talk with Age Comes Beauty. Uh, today I will dive more into, into the past, uh, past, present, and future of uh, immutable collections. As you already heard, uh, the talk will be a chess timer talk. So uh, the idea is that I have like 20 minutes of speaking time and uh, that there's 20 minutes of discussion time like uh, throughout. And as you heard, like in order to make it work, uh, I have to count on your support. So, well, uh, yeah, so interruptions are not only welcome, they are even mandatory. How did the, uh, this talk came into place? Well, maybe some of you remember that last year at Carry On, uh, David Nolan gave a keynote address, uh, which he entitled, How to, How to Win Big uh, with Old Ideas. And in David's talk, he dived into like four key concepts that in his opinion made closure a success in the long run. And the four things that he mentioned were like Lisp, tries, data log, and regular expressions. Any of you an idea like what I'm talking about today? Well, it's tries. So what are tries? The name try comes from the word retrieval and uh, it's actually a data structure that lets you search, like store, search, and delete data. So you can imagine it's like a set data structure. Um, and tries have like one particular property that makes them interesting, and that's that they encode the prefix of the search keys that you put uh, to them. So on the left, we have like a, a three words that start all with the letter C. So the try data structure will uh, account for that, that they have a common prefix. But further on, two of the words have like a longer prefix. They start like with three letters C O U. And the same accounts for the words on the right. Like all of them start with F. Some of them have a bit longer prefix and some of them have another longer prefix. So tri data structures were uh, conceived in the late 50s early 60s, like independently by two different researchers. And if you look at the papers, how did they describe that and conceptually uh, uh, yeah, devised tri data structures, you can see exactly that. You have a tree where you encode the common prefixes. And in this case, we have a tree of tables that always map uh, from one character to the possible subsequent characters that uh, can follow the character. So all these uh, words that we have here occur in this table as well. And like letter by letter, we, uh, we say like which, which letter can follow the, uh, the next one. So the second person who devised the uh, uh, tries uh, simultaneously was uh, uh, Edward Pretke. And as you can see here, uh, it's a different view for the same problem. Like instead of like having nested tables in the tree form, we have like a, a really table uh, representation where on the top we have like the alphabet and in principle what used to be before um, a note in the tree is now like a row in the table. Well, <clears throat> so to summarize the properties of tri data structures, it's on the positive side a general purpose search tree and that can cope with like variable length input strings. So all the words that we had before like had different lengths and they can like grow arbitrary large. And by design, tri data structures group common prefixes. So what's not so good about them is that they are relatively memory efficient, at least like the state like of the late 50s and how they were conceived. And because we encode character by character in the tree, it's also like a linear time operation. So like lookup, insertion, deletion, they will also like all take linear time. So if we skip forward, uh, nowadays uh, tri data structures are used heavily in standard libraries of functional languages, like Clojure, as I mentioned before, Haskell, or Scala. And so what do I mean by collection? If you look at the 
the standard library or of the documentation of uh, like a language like Java, you will find that a collection is nothing else than just a representation of a group of objects. And these representations of a group of objects can be like different data types, like lists, sets, maps, decks, multi-maps. They can be have different like orderings or be stored unordered. They might be like mutable or immutable. And they can be processed either like sequentially in parallel or concurrent. So as you can see, like collections are like, uh, yeah, like really broad, but uh, tri data structures can be used to implement like most or if not all of them in languages like Clojure, Rest, or Scala. So what makes collection data structures interesting is that they uh, that they are general purpose toolbox. So they're at your disposal, at the disposal of, of, of every programmer, because they ship with the standard libraries of these languages. And as such, they should be also like balance the time of the operations and also the memory consumptions. But if you look back at what we said before about tri data structures, well, they have some good sides, but they also have some negatives attached to them. And that's that they are relatively memory efficient, inefficient, and that they have a linear time complexity of the update operations. Just a clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, it's linear time in the in the, the length of the in search. the key length. Yeah. Not right. linear time in the number of elements. Yeah. Right. Important distinction. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions so far? regarding tri data structures, the power store, the principal design of them. Because of course, it has to be linear in the key length, since if you don't look at the key, you can't look it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so in complexity terms, it must be linear. Yeah, so. Of course, it is. Well, you can also like sometimes uh, uh, get away with just comparing parts of the key. So if for example, yeah, but let's say like uh, uh, if, if you're just interested, like if it's not in uh, contained in the set of like uh, uh, keys that you have stored, let's say you're looking up a word with, with the letter set, and you just store words as before, like with the letter C and F, then you can like immediately distinguish that that prefix is not present there. So it's, it's not always like in the full length of the keys. And it can also be linear in the number of cache misses. That, that can be a yeah, that, that's another dimension. Yes, right, yeah. All right. So in, in the context of collection data structures, like uh, what changed what changed the adoption of hash drives and made them actually like feasible <coughs> under, uh, for implementing uh, fast mutable collections it was a paper by Field Bagwell in, in the year 2001. And actually, he proposed changes uh, that addressed the two weak points that we uh, saw before. So, uh, how to make them fast and space efficient. And in order to make them fast, uh, what he introduced is, uh, or what he merges, like, is to, to use hashing for these tri data, tri data structures. And what hashing does is, in principle, instead of like having arbitrary length keys, you just make them fixed length keys. So in the context of Java, for example, or Scala, or any like language that runs on, uh, on the JVM, hash codes usually are 32 bit locks. And it doesn't matter if you're looking like for, for like a search key found, or something longer, or something short. You will always have like the same length uh, of your key. But hold on, before we looked at character by character when we encoded uh, the tri data structure and the prefixes of that. So what shall we do here? Okay, so like using bit by bit and making a tree out of that? Okay, good idea. Okay, why five? Like no, a number? A span, a span with 
Okay. Any other ideas? Okay. Well, it turns out five is a lucky number. <laughs> now, essentially, what you can do is you just chunk up and divide the long string in bigger groups. And then each of these individual, like five bit elements, are actually now becoming letters in your alphabet. So each letter is actually five bits long and like can have up to like 32 different uh, values that you can take. And well, if that's our new alphabet, trees that we will build up will actually use that alphabet on the edges. So we will encode the tree not based on the content directly, but on, on the hashes of the content. And that gives us like nice properties because the hash code is like 32 bit long. And if we chunk that up like in sequences of five bits, we limit essentially the depths of the tree. So to make it a bit more visual, uh, I will switch back from, uh, from strings that we had before uh, to integers. Why integers? Because like integers, the hash code of the int is the value itself. So that makes like things for demonstration purposes easy. And if we now take the concept before and build up a tree out of these integers, we get something like that. And if you remember the two, uh, the two illustrations that I showed you in the beginning of like the tree of tables, and the second one was the table representation itself, that comes very close to that. But that's not memory efficient at all, or is it? So if I want to store, how much elements do we have here? Uh, seven elements, and I have four times 32 bit arrays. What can we do about that? How can we do that? Like, how can we do that? How can we make it more memory efficient? So, what Bagler's paper proposed was to use bitmaps in order to designate which of the slots is actually in use. And by using bitmaps, we can then subsequently compress that and remove all the empty slots. And by doing that, we get, we get like a concise representation of what we had before. So in the code skeleton, we have like a 32 bit uh, bitmap and then an array that can grow up to 32 elements long. You can't hear me back there? No, I'm not, I'm not OK. <laughs> All right. So the properties that you can expect from such a, such a search tree is that it's a wide but like a very shallow tree and essentially it takes you at maximum like seven steps to find your element and in terms of like complexity it's it's not like a constant time operation as like in the hash table but like the seven steps is essentially constant so as the scala people for example will call it mm -hmm. uh, what you have more cash business than a hash table Sorry? Well, you have more cache misses than a hash table. So in a hash table, mm -hmm. uh, you'll have, uh, if you're lucky, uh, you're going to get the hash bucket right on the first try. Right. Yeah, that, that's like one of the differences. And uh, I will come later to the point in why these three structures are actually like in favor in like immutable collections compared to, let's say, flat uh, 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 tables. But in essence, it's that you can copy smaller fragments. And by copying smaller fragments, like for deriving a new data structure from your old one, uh, you're winning something there. So like your update operations get much faster, but you're paying in sort of like cash misses in directions, for example, that you, uh, you have to get through. That's right. So it's... Uh, under, under this structure, you also have to store the original unhashed keys just as you would have hashed it also, right? Yeah, right. right. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's another disadvantage also with respect to ordinary tries, which is that uh, you don't get the uh, you don't get store records with all the prefixes that you encounter along the way to the word. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some algorithms, you actually want to get uh, the reason that you use the try is yeah. you want information about mm -hmm. the prefixes. For example, in some pattern matching algorithms. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I agree. And uh, uh, the difference is, so there's also like, um, there are tries used in, in databases or like uh, as indexes, like for databases, especially in the context of in-memory databases. And they're the ways that they don't sort or they don't hash because they want range queries, for example. Yeah, so that's exactly, yeah, exactly. what you're saying there. But for collection purposes, for example, like hashing gives you like different uh, advantages and they are also like nicely compressible as uh, uh, as you saw before, like in, in the picture. And one of the advantages as well is by, by using the hashes, you can uh, shortcut, for example. That's uh, what, uh, what I elaborated before. So if you know that one prefix doesn't occur, for example, in the whole try data structure, you just skip that. You know it's not there. Some other questions? All right. <clears throat> so that's the basis of uh, what was introduced in 2001 by, by uh, Phil Bagbuck. So in a sense, uh, using hashing for try data structures, and that means like making variable length keys to fixed length keys. And the second core idea was using bitmaps in order like to compress the empty space out of the tree nodes. So, but recently there was also like uh, a lot of research going on in order to yet improve these data structures because like collection data structures, they are like at the heart of programmers and they're like widespread and widely used. So, uh, ba based on like that representation, you can make them even faster, like in, in uh, exploiting cache locality, for example, of iteration, or even like using structural operations for equality checking and uh, and then get yet uh, uh, other speedups. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You're mentioning caching. So when you first showed us the, uh, about the hashing, mm -hmm. at first, so that representation was okay. It was more memory efficient because you just used the five bits at once. But what about caching? So, is it cache efficient to do hashing uh, at all, or? Yeah, I mean, using that approach over just enumerating at every branch, I mean, branching on every possible bit. Oh, you mean branching about every possible bit? Basically, depth for Yeah, but uh, so. So for immutable data structures, there there is a there is a trade-off between like lookup time and time for uh, for updating the data structure. So if you want to modify it, and uh, empirically, it is shown that uh, there the sweet spot is around like grouping four to five bits, for example. So you can, for example, improve the runtime uh, by just uh, using larger sequences, so like six, seven, or eight bits, for example. But then you pay uh, once you uh, you're going to update the nodes because then you have like 128 like large arrays per node that you have to copy, for example. So it's it's really a trade-off and uh, uh, and the design that you can uh, get both like fast uh, lookups and also like relatively fast uh, update operations at the same time. Mm -hmm. Can you make data structures that kind of adapt themselves to the usage pattern so if they if they're looking up a lot and it says oh I'm going to be organized. Um, so in, in principle, yes, and uh, that's also like a, a subject I'm interested in. But in terms of like how you spread out, that's that's rather complicated because um, try data structures they expand lazily. So as said, like if the prefixes differ, of let's say with a set of two elements that we insert, and both have like a different prefix on the beginning, both are stored in the root node actually. Well, only if they like only if they differ in the prefixes, I grow the tree. And the same goes if I'm adding elements, like the tree grows as needed, for example. And exactly that growing, that lazily growing of the tree makes it very complicated to have these variable lengths, for example, uh, sizes of nodes. So there are probably other ways, but like not in terms of uh, uh, how much nodes you group together. Mm -hmm. 
should, should we gather that you're giving a talk about this data structure because it's currently the best uh, choice on CPUs uh, for uh, immutable collections of strings? Uh, uh, I, I mean, I can think of five or six other data structures for this, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, patrician trees and pad arrays and Judy trees and uh, perfect hashing yeah. uh, and so on. Uh, so is this the current winner? Uh, I would say it's the current winner because it's a uh, it's it's an old concept that was uh, easily let's say uh, uh, refreshed let's say with new technology and uh, adopted towards uh, uh, some of the needs and um, so one thing that makes uh, or that uh, uh, made these data structures popular was actually CPU support for bit counting operations that was introduced like in the uh, in the mainstream, let's say with Intel's uh, Haswell processors. So yeah, I agree like there are plenty of other candidates, but these are like a viable default, uh, defaults, let's say that uh, get all of the, or, or a lot of like uh, checks marked. And there's a good implementation, uh, or good implementations for most languages. Uh, yeah, right. So so hash memory of tries, uh, that's like uh, uh, what Bagwell proposed, are, they are widespread in many languages. So first, uh, they were implemented by Clojure, then later they came uh, back to Scala, and now they are spread like throughout like a, a, a large ecosystem, like including Haskell, Erlang, and plenty of like other languages. So, and most of the implementations are actually based on Bagwell's original paper from 2001, and just recently, let's say from 2010, 2011 on, there were um, there was like much more research interest in also like making these data structures concurrent, for example, also like in investing in parallelism, porting these concepts to uh, vector implementations, for example, so immutable sequences, and also improving the memory efficiency, for example, of this concept. Thanks. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Um, well, it's <laughs> what's the baseline? Well, the baseline, the baseline is closures and scalars implementations, for example, of uh, immutable hash tries as they are in the standard library. And here, particularly, I'm talking about equality checking. So you're comparing two trees to each other, or like two sets, two maps, two tri-based data structures. So you you want to figure out are they equal in content. And what you usually have in collections is this iterator based style uh, um, traversal and abstraction. So you iterate over one collection and semantically do a lookup for each element in the other. And tries offer you also like structural operations. So uh, for insertion, deletion, and lookup, structural operations are the default thing because that's by design how the data structure operates. But in the context of collection libraries, it's also important that you look at the larger set of operations, like iteration, for example, equality checking, mapping each element of a collection, like uh, uh, or applying a function to each element of a collection. And here particularly, um, it, wa it was the case that the structural operations were not implemented are for equality checking. And the reason for that is that uh, in order to perform structural operations, you have to keep the data structure canonical. So like that two data structures that have the same content are also like structurally equal. That's something, for example, that's more natural in Haskell than maybe like in other languages. And here it's like an implementation detail of the try data structure itself. So by making both data structures canonical, you can apply structural equality checking. And with structural equality checking, you are much faster than like doing it logically. Right. That that. Yeah. That that. that yeah. But uh, th that's the same the same ballpark of operations like a uh, union intersection, uh, uh, equality checking, and there's like plenty of more things that you can do structurally on the tree itself. And uh, these things are not that widely like uh, uh, spread and implemented. For example, also like in languages out there.
<clears throat> so coming from like Bagwell's Hampton implementation, uh, so one thing that you might note, color coded there is that there is a mix of data elements and like sub or like references to sub tables. So and these are actually occur just based on the hash codes that you feed here. So uh, with different content, you get like different orderings. And if we talk about iteration, for example, and cache locality of the, these data structures, there's like one particular drawback because if you want to iterate, let's say, over this set and yield all the elements, what you would have to do is either traverse each node twice, like uh, yielding all the elements per node, or what you otherwise would get is you would like go up and for like uh, down and up a lot. And that also like would reside in a lot of cache misses because like you're switching context a lot. You're just uh, like in order traversing the tree. So something that uh, uh, also like changed recently is the co encoding was adopted in order to group likewise elements together. So all the references to subtrees stay on the right, but all the data elements stay on the left. So if you now iterate over the tree data structure, you can yield all the data elements first before you traverse into subtrees. And that gives you, for example, like the speed ups of six, uh, six x, what I mentioned before for iteration, for example, compared to the traditional like hash and try implementations. So what do you need in order to make that work? Well, essentially yet another bitmap because you need to make explicit what nodes are data elements and what are what cells represent data elements and what cells represent like subtrees to distinguish the prefixes further. So well they also like got much uh, much smaller in memory footprint compared uh, to the previous state of the art. And how comes that? What I showed you here is it's just a permutation of the elements. So it's a permutation of the elements grouping things together. Uh, if we now go from a set data structure to a map data structure, as it is, for example, implemented in Clojure, the convention is that key value pairs are either stored in line so like next to each other, or if I happen to have like a, a, a subtree, the convention is that the key slot is left empty and the, the value slot is like reused as a reference to subtrees. And by doing the same trick of permuting the elements, we actually like can encode like different lengths uh, slices in our array. So like all the key value pairs are of like lengths two, whereas like the uh, the references to sub nodes just occupy like one reference. Wait, yeah. So how do you know if you permute the array? How do you know which bit values each uh, cell is uh, for? Yeah, uh, that's something I'm skipping over because I'm uh, I'm keeping it visual. But essentially, um, for the original tri data structure. Sorry, you have one bit, one bit per slot, and the one bit per slot really just just acts as a uh, uh, for compression. So like you indicate if it's there or not, and by doing that you can like have a function that, with the help of the bitmap and your position that you want to look up, you can recover, for example, uh, let's say that the physical slot in the array that you want to address. Well. In order to make the permutation work, it's actually a function that takes two bitmaps into account. And what you can do is then either like do a sort of like offset addressing that you say, like with one bitmap of the data map, I can determine the bounds where the second one starts. So that's like one way in order to do it. So it's like a compression and permutation at the same time. Or you can even do it like more cleverly in order, so it's also indicated here, you see these numbers are swapped. So like index 0 and 24 are swapped. So like they are in reverse order. And essentially it's like as heap and stack grow together, like you have like two different offsets. You say like uh, slot 0 is my offset for my 
key value pairs and like the length like the the other end of the array is the offset for all the subtrees so once you do that you don't even like need any kind of offset addressing you just need to count like the offsets based on the data elements or on the node elements so you, you do a case distinction on, based on like what you're looking for you do the addressing Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So, so far I didn't talk about immutability. I, I just said like these data structures are like the state of the art like for immutable uh, collections out there. But essentially tri data structures, you can use them for all kind of data structures like concurrent, mutable, immutable data structures. And essentially the only difference is, is when and how much you copy. Copy. So, for the immutable cases, why would you care at all about immutability? And uh, some of the reasons are that immutability gives you like a simpler mental programming model. They allow you also like uh, to worry less in the case of concurrency because you can't corrupt your state like from other threads. And further on, like you cannot apply like several optimization based on the constantness of your data. So. How do you implement like a mutable version of a trial? Well, if a mutable would like to edit the data structure, let's say it's a potentially huge, huge data structure, the, and add the element 34 to it, I would just like put it here in the node. Once I've located like a word to store it, I do that. And so that would be by mutation. And a simple copy and write approach would copy the whole data structure before modifying it in order like to keep immutability guarantees alive. But that's not a smart approach. Like if I have an arbitrarily like huge data structure, like doing a copy on write before modifying it, that that's not performant and that, that doesn't also like fit uh, the con like the context of a collection data structures where uh, we want something compact, like relatively like efficient in terms of runtime and also relatively efficient in memory footprint. So what three data structures allow you is actually to do a sort of like delta, like to produce a delta of your update. So once again, the same situation, I'm going to like insert elements 34 here, but I leave the old data structure intact. So I'm not going to modify it, but I'm yet producing another version without or like with as little updating as possible. And in this case, I would just follow the pass down to where I'm like going to modify the element, clone these nodes on the way, and add the element there, and reference everything that was not modified uh, yeah, from the previous data structure. So essentially, what I get is like, yeah, so, if, uh, I just have like to, to, to copy a fraction of, uh, uh, of the whole tree. And that is actually what makes tri data structures uh, good for implementing immutable collections. Because if you look at libraries out there like Google's Guava, uh, like a, a Google's Guava, it's also like a full fledged collection library, they have immutable collections, but they are not, uh, they are not incrementally updatable as the data structures that you have, for example, in closure in Scala. Mm -hmm. So when you say uh, you want to compute this delta, so how do you do it to look for which part needs to be replaced? You just look for the element and you upload the edges together? No, the lookup, uh, the lookup happens like based on the prefix. Yeah. So what I showed before is like in, in the traditional try, you would uh, do it like based on the content. Mm -hmm. Here you do it like based on the, the hash code like prefixes. and all the, uh, the operations, uh, like lookup, insertion, and deletion, will make the same traversal based on the prefix. And once you're at a node, and you know like the offset where you should store the element, then you make a case distinction like based on if an element is already there or not. And if it's not there, like you know that you can like update it, for example, and otherwise, yeah. So what I now mostly talked about is in how to like uh, 
how the original proposal, like from Phil Becker, for example, was uh, subsequently refiled. But as said, there's also like similar approaches that like adopt the same uh, um, the, the same data structure to make it concurrent and to make it suitable for arbitrary like sequence data structures. So how performant are these data structures or at least like what's challenging to address about that? So as we already discussed this, is there a difference between like let's say flat array data structures and trees? Well, there is a difference because like there are like more indirections happening, for example, in order like to locate an element. And yeah, it's 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 you have like a small lock operation instead of a constant time operation. So essentially what one can do is improve the locality between the nodes. So if you would get as fast as an array data structure is, why not like making your tree more like an array? So instead of like having this representation of the tree, you could also like think about a sort of like serialized or linearized representation of the tree where all your data is like continuously in memory. And you just make like small jumps, logarithmic jumps forward in order like to locate your data item that you would like to have. And the other thing is also true in uh, once you have different data structures that structurally share a part of their content. You can also think about how to represent the data in contrast to the tree, like to the original tree itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, in, but in that approach, it does make uh, a lot, it does pay off to keep the bucket or, or the pointers forward group, right? Because if not, it would be, because the cache locality you might not, you might spend a whole cache tree to read some values and some pointers forward as you stand things, right? Yeah. Or, or not. Does, does that happen at all? Can you, can you do that? Uh, no. The issue is, um, so you're just like always having a point lookup. Uh, the only time you're interested in all the, the elements grouped together is actually once you want to iterate or like batch process uh, your collection. Let's say you want to iterate over all the elements, you, you want to perform a stream operation on them. And otherwise, if I have a particular key that I, I want to look up, for example, I really like jump to a particular section and then like continue the jumps there. So there doesn't really make a difference in how, let's say, inside of the node the, the elements are arranged, but it's more, it makes much more difference how the nodes of a tree are located like a, in, uh, in memory. So like the locality like between the nodes themselves. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. Just so feel free to send me straight away. Mm -hmm. But let's say that you take the first five bits, and so it happens to be that the value that you're looking for is in, would be in, in that particular uh, set of values. And so you don't need to go down down the rabbit hole. Right. Line. Yes. 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 But in that case, right, if the value, if you flatten the list like mm -hmm. that, right, if all the values were at the beginning, you might read less and having to read more because oh well, then, and then there's some forward pointers. Okay, I understand your question. So, so like, so is there something? Is there a parallel to, to that thinking? That yeah. So if I if I understand your question correctly, is what you're saying is because we lazily grow the tree, so just if needed, and uh, that we have to like to do less jumps. Or no? But, well, hmm? Okay, so, so, and these kind of behaviors and like how you like deal with locality between the tree nodes actually like varies like really like from language to language and also like really is dependent on like what your language, for example, exposes to you in terms of like memory, uh, memory control. So in terms of Java, for example, or Clojure and Scala, like languages that are implemented on uh, uh, on a runtime that like takes care of memory management, you can actually do much that of yourself. But these op optimizations can be implemented, for example, like in the memory management <coughs> subsystem, or also like in terms of like a copying garbage collector. It takes care of these kind of uh, optimizations. 
so and another thing that was also already addressed is that their uh, tri data structures are also used for in memory databases, but their hashing is not used. It's like rather you encode, as in the original approach, the data elements themselves in the search key. Um, but recently there was also like much more focus on on how, yeah, like how to improve uh, in memory databases in generally with uh, advancements in the context of like tri data structures in general. And in my opinion, in memory databases and collections are also like growing much and much more together in terms of like concepts that they are sharing and like where one can learn from each other, for example. So, <clears throat> you can learn from each other. And so something that I was skipping before as well as I was showing you like how like physically like a, uh, how the tri data structure is represented internally. But uh, I skipped over the code is what you need actually to get to your data elements. And in terms of like the original like hash and memory try approach, uh, it's a mix of like bitmap processing operations and also like runtime type checks. And that's something what I consider is the beauty of the approach and how it changes over time. Because not only conceptually, let's say these are like more beautiful to look at because similar like typed elements are grouped together. But also because of that, like the code that you have to write in order like to process such a hash drive gets much easier to read and to write. So if you're interested Sorry. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about these data structures, you can look at closure, for example, on the JVM at Scala or also like on Capsule, that's like a library uh, where I'm also involved that uh, implements like some of the more recent uh, uh, concepts of hash drives. And to conclude it with the words of Pat Highland, immutability changes everything. So there is a cost attached to immutability, but most of the time, like we can afford to pay it. And it also like pays off in different ways. Thank you. Thank you.